Hi friends, and welcome to another New Testament Keyword Bible Study. This is number 21 in the series that I have been producing for you. And again, I remind you, what I'm doing is trying to keep them in line with the lectionary. Um, but you can choose a word. Every study is complete within itself. So today the word is spirit. And the the way the Greeks pronounce the word is pneuma, pneuma, or pneumatos. And pneuma, of course, having to do with air, breath. The key passage that I've chosen for this study is Mark chapter 9, verses 1 to 15. And in that passage, it talks about Jesus being baptized by John in the River Jordan. And as he was baptized, the heavens opened and the Spirit hovered descended like a dove over him. Now the image there is very intentional. It's meant to recreate for you the image of the Spirit of God hovering over the water of creation. Isn't that cool? So what happened after the baptism? The scripture goes on to say the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. Now you may have noticed that this passage um, is the same one that we use for the word metanoia, or repent. But the word in the passage we're looking at today, as I said, is spirit. Now, in order to help you with that, I want to take three steps. First one is to introduce the word cardia. Does that sound in any way familiar to you? Think about the doctor who cares for your heart, a cardiologist. You will want to look at another key word Bible study on the word cardia. I haven't produced that one yet, but it's an essential teaching that shows how the New Testament incorporates body, mind, and soul, pneuma, into the whole person. So that's step one. Now I want to move on to the second step. St. Paul saw how body, mind, and spirit formed the essence, the heart, of who a person was. When Paul was urging people to be transformed by the renewing of their minds, he was referring to the interior person. He was referring to the immaterial, or perhaps better to say, the spiritual side of the person. It's your essence, the spirit that's within you, that gives you life. So then you can see the second step that I'm talking about. There is a human spirit. It's not the same as the Holy Spirit. The human spirit is sort of illustrated a good place is in Luke chapter 8 verse 55. Jesus is raising Jairus' daughter. And the scripture reads literally, the spirit of her returned. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. What do you think he might have meant by that? Well, no doubt that he seemed to mean those who were humble by nature, people who were not proud and puffed up, who were lowly in spirit. Uh, every time I hear the Magnificent, you know, the, the song of Mary, it says, the rich, he has sent empty away. And to me, the image is that he is sending away those who are arrogant and self-fulfilled and proud because God cannot give those people anything. You have to come with a heart that is humble, that is poor in spirit. And it also means from the New Testament context when we read it, those who have been wounded, wounded by life and wounded perhaps because they have been victimized by others. The fight has gone out of them. The point is, in the New Testament, there is a difference between pneuma, our spirit, and pneumatas or pneuma hagion. Hagion meaning holy, the Holy Spirit. So now we're moving into step three, aren't we? 
the Holy Spirit is able to transform or transfigure the human spirit through the power of Jesus. Step three is when we begin to talk about the third person of the Holy Trinity. In Mark chapter 9, verses 1 to 15, we understand that it was the Holy Spirit who compelled Jesus to go out into the wild after his baptism. It's a great play on words. Jesus was not led by the Spirit, gently or otherwise. He was drove. That's a good Newfoundland word, wasn't it? He was compelled. He had to go. In Acts chapter 19, verse 2, we receive from the Scripture a more personal question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they answered, we did not know there was any such thing as a Holy Spirit. It was Jesus who introduced the concept of the third person of the Trinity to his disciples. When he, in his talking and sharing and teaching, reflects in any way on the Old Testament, he refers to the Spirit of God. The New Testament has this image of prophets who, who were blessed because the Spirit of Yahweh, the Spirit of God, came upon them, and they walked in the Spirit. And with, with kings who, were, who became bad and who failed, the Spirit left them. Jesus, in Matthew twenty-two forty-three refers to David having spoken in the Spirit of God. In John's Gospel, Jesus tells his disciples that the Father will send Numa Tohagion, a Holy Spirit, in my name. So we begin to see that the Spirit, um, uh, to quote the Creed, is now proceeding from the Son. He tells them that the Holy Spirit will teach wisdom, provide instruction, and remind them of all I have told you. St. Paul provides images of the Holy Spirit with words like this, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of a living God, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Son. The word pneuma might remind you of the word pneumatic. That has to do with the force of air, the force of air. The Spirit is like air, and in theological thinking, it is the very breath of God. This breath of God is breathed into, like Adam was when God gave him life, or inspired. That's why we say the Bible is inspired, people are inspired. That's where the word comes from. The word for spirit in the Old Testament is this beautiful word. Ruach. So when you get to Paul's more mature writings, such as Ephesians 1, chapter 3, the writer there reminds his readers that when you came to Christ, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And the early church understood that the role of the Spirit in the lives of those who were sealed was to bring comfort, guidance, teaching. The Spirit became known as the Paraclete. The word Parakletos was applied very commonly in the time of Jesus to legal counsel or an advocate who went to give assistance and comfort to those who were brought before a court of law. Think about paralegals today. Um, the disciples looked upon Jesus himself as the comforter, the one who comforts. But from Jesus came this promise, I will send another comforter to you, my followers, after I leave the world. You can look that up in John chapter 14. The assurance of this sealing of the Spirit and the presence of Jesus in the world through that Spirit would be accomplished throughout future generations with prayer 
and the laying on of hands. When a bishop lays hands on someone for confirmation, that is what we are doing. God bless you. Thank you for joining me for another New Testament Keyword Bible study. See you soon.